Bodie Lang here, and this is probably the longest video I've ever made, but I encourage you to stick around or save the video and watch it later because there's a lot of good stuff in here. And in this video, we'll discuss the worst episode of Joe Rogan. In this video, I'm responding to the worst, most air-ridden episode of the Joe Rogan Show that I've ever seen, because nearly the entire episode is endorsing all the lies of Black Lives Matter and Democrats about race relations in the United States. And while Joe Rogan is a very likable guy, and he seems like a decent person, but I felt like there's so much wrong with this episode that I at least should put something out there in the ether that corrects some of this garbage, and maybe someone who has seen the original video might someday stumble upon this and have more accurate information. Um, who was just drunk and compliant and peaceful until they were telling him they were going to arrest him, even said, get me an Uber. And what his point was, it was a very good point, why were the police even called for that? This is a nonviolent person who just happened to be drunk. Was he doing something he shouldn't have been doing? Yes. But obviously compliant, polite, speaking just like very reasonably until it escalated into this tussle. And then he lost his life. Richard Brooks was so drunk he fell asleep at a drive-thru. It wasn't as if this tussle just happened either. He attacked the police, stole their taser, which is a weapon, and pointed it at them. So Joe Rogan says, he's a nonviolent person who was just drunk. No, clearly he's not a nonviolent person. If he were, he'd be alive today. He attacked two police officers. The police officer is the victim here, not Richard Brooks. So let's be clear about that. The police officer was the one doing his job and then he and his partner were attacked and now he's being charged with murder and fighting for his life, not because what he did was wrong or illegal, but because the left is attempting to sacrifice him for the narrative. And we're seeing this a lot now where Americans, particularly white people, who get in conflict against anyone who can advance the left's narrative are being targeted by government officials to sacrifice them for the movement. You see this in the case in St. Louis, where a guy defending his home is being targeted by state and local officials. This practice going on right now is to try and intimidate Americans that they should not fight back against the left because these corrupt politicians will charge them with crimes anyways to make an example out of them. This behavior is abhorrent and Joe Rogan shouldn't be advocating for it. Okay, let's keep going. The system is rigged. It's rigged against them. It's not even evenly rigged against them. So, you know, in black communities, there's a perception it's specifically rigged against us. And you know what? It is. But the way it is is very subtle, right? It's not a matter of racism being ubiquitous, you know, inside every white head. It's not like that. It's, this has very little to do with modern racism. But what it has to do with is a property of our system. So, you know, um, there's a cybernetic principle the purpose of a system is what it does. It means that don't listen to what somebody says that the system is for. Look at what it accomplishes. That's what mm. it's for. And our system basically has two things that it accomplishes. Um, it basically keeps real change from happening. And the reason it keeps real change from happening is because people who are winning in the present system will continue to win if the system continues to do what it does, and they may lose if the system changes and starts doing something else. So it creates what I would argue is a kind of organic conservatism. Those with power don't want change because it threatens them. Okay, so here he's basically saying our system is rigged against people, specifically black people, and he refers to this resistance to change as organic conservatism that is motivated to keep black people down. There's truth in what he's saying except it's not applicable to the right. Democrats have been running these black communities for decades and have every incentive to keep black people down because that is how blacks have remained a reliable voter block for them. Black people prospering is a disaster for Democrats. The system is not rigged against black people, but Democrats teach people that because it helps them accomplish several things. One, by blaming racism, Democrats can pretend to care about black people by offering solutions that always empower those Democrats who are often the actual problem. And so these Democrats remain in power and in many ways grow their power through this race baiting. Blame the system, give Democrats the power to fundamentally transform the system, but the solution will never actually arrive. But second, blaming systemic racism also provides an opportunity to demonize anyone who suggests the system is not rigged. Those who say black people are as free as anyone else to either succeed or fail on their own are portrayed and smeared as racist because they don't agree that the system is rigged. And the reason they don't agree, or so we're told, is because they benefit from this failed racist system. And they are opposed to change just to maintain their power. Of course, this is like nearly everything the left says. It's projection. 
Democrats are the profiteers of black misery and have benefited from crying racism, so it's a win-win for them, because they get to placate to black people while also smearing their political opponents. And lastly, by devising these conspiracy theories like white privilege or systemic racism or unconscious bias, they can distract people from examining the epic failures of Democrats who have been running these dire communities for decades. They definitely don't want people looking at who has been in control of the deadliest, most misery-ridden places in the country. They don't want you to look at who has been governing these places or where these kids are being killed and start asking questions about the effectiveness of what Democrats have done over the years. They don't want you to know that Detroit, Michigan used to have the highest per capita income of any city in the United States back in the 60s before a long consecutive reign of Democrats took over the city and drove it into the ground. It's the same story of many urban communities. Recently, Trump claimed 20 of the most violent cities in the U.S. were run by Democrats, and Democrats do not like when people call them out like this, so the Washington Post ran a piece where they fact-checked him and claimed it false. They wrote, Trump keeps claiming that the most dangerous cities in America are all run by Democrats. They aren't. Why is it false? Well, it turns out that only 17 of the top 20 most violent cities are owned and operated by Democrats. Two are independent, and one is Republican. But if you adjust for population size, 19 of the most violent cities are run by Democrats, and one is independent. Zero are run by Republicans. So Trump's claim is basically true, but they call it false because there's one independent city mayor. But the whole point of the system is rigged narrative is just to distract you from Democrat failures. As Garrison Bergeron writes, the great deception of Black Lives Matter is to pretend that black people are constantly murdered by brutal police and ruined by the systemic racism that pervades white society. The data regarding deaths of people in police custody refute this, and thousands of blacks are killed annually by rampant gang violence in the Democrats' cities. But Black Lives Matter is the hand that Democrats want you to see, as with the magician's trick. The system is rigged as a distraction to alleviate Democrats from being blamed for their destruction of black communities. Remember when he says, you know, um, there's a cybernetic principle. The purpose of a system is what it does. It means that don't listen to what somebody says that the system is for. Look at what it accomplishes. That's what mm. it's for. While I'm looking, and it's obvious that Democrat policies and programs have done nothing but destroy black communities, but they will continue along the lines of promoting this false narrative. And the other thing that our system does is it reproduces present uh, patterns of distribution into the future. And what that means is racism that has almost died out is still alive and well in a sense because all you have to do is take people who are born into a neighborhood that is uh, devoid of opportunity and continue that pattern. If no opportunity shows up, then people who were oppressed are now going to continue to be oppressed. And so it feels personal, but it isn't. It's just reproducing an existing pattern. And a lot of that emanates from these communities that have been disenfranchised and economically distraught from slavery. Like literally from that where we're dealing with the echoes of slavery. We're still talking about African Americans. Well, you know, when, when, when they talk about things like this, they talk about the legacy of slavery. Right, right. And, 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 uh, and I argue, well, empirically, it's not that, it's the legacy of the welfare state. Because as of 1960, which is almost 100 years after slavery has ended, uh, the majority of black kids were being raised in two-parent households. But within one generation after the welfare state, that had dropped down to a minority. So that the majority of black kids today are, are, are raised in one-parent households. When you think about it, I mean, uh, centuries of slavery, and generations of Jim Crow, did not destroy the black family. But one, one generation of the welfare state did. And it doesn't get addressed. And when people do bring it up and they start talking about reparations, people roll their eyes and people go, oh, that was so long ago. But the results of that are still alive today in the South. They're st still alive today in many communities that were redlined uh, as recently as the 1960s, right? Uh, that's exactly right. And so it, it, we basically have set ourselves up for a confused response because there is a subtlety. The fact that ancient racism, people who are dead, their racism still haunts us today through mechanisms of the reproduction of patterns of distribution. And mind you, when people hear distribution, they freak out because they think you're talking about wealth. I'm not talking about wealth and we can talk about why I wouldn't bother. But what we're talking about is opportunity. Opportunity has been hoarded. It has been concentrated in some zip codes and almost totally excluded from other zip codes. And so 
you're right. The uh, patterns of slavery moved into Jim Crow, and now they've moved into a phase where they are very subtly infused in into our system. And so it is causing people to have the sense that there is an enemy and it is out to get me when it's not exactly an enemy that's out to get you. It's a pattern. Okay, so let me unpack a few things that were said in this exchange. There is not a limit to opportunity. It cannot be hoarded. Opportunity is not distributed by anyone. There is no pool of opportunity that is offered to white people or black people and black people just get less. Opportunity is available to everyone. The paths may have more or less obstacles according to the circumstances you're born into, but one cannot equally distribute opportunity because nobody distributes it at all. A self-made millionaire who came from nothing and whose children may be born into better circumstances has not hoarded opportunity from anyone. But he goes on to say that there's a feeling the system is rigged against you. And so it is causing people to have the sense that there is an enemy and it is out to get me. Yes, this feeling is the product of racist Democrats telling black people that the system is rigged against them. This is circular reasoning. Democrats preach the system is rigged to distract from their failures and maintain power, as I mentioned earlier, and then they point to these learned feelings of a rigged system as proof of their truthfulness. To highlight just how learned these claims really are, in 1994, four of 10 Democrats said racial discrimination is why blacks can't get ahead. In 2016, six of 10 Democrats said racial discrimination is why blacks can't get ahead. Is the world more racist in 2016 or 2020 than it was in 1994? No, but the left has ramped up the propaganda and rhetoric trying to convince people that it is because they need the black vote and really don't want black people looking at the consequences of leftism in their communities. Then, Joe Rogan comments about resistance to reparations, suggesting people dismiss it because it was, oh, it was so long ago. And he suggests that conversations about reparations are still worthwhile because the reason black communities are struggling is that these are sort of leftovers of the institution of slavery. No, it's not just that slavery was so long ago. Many of us reject reparations because one, it's totally unfeasible. And I'm not gonna go into detail about how unfeasible it is, especially when you get into talking about biracial people or people who have immigrated here. But more importantly, we reject reparations because we don't penalize people for crimes that others commit. You don't get to steal my money and give it to someone else for what someone else did to someone else. If your grandfather killed my grandfather in 1850, I cannot sue all his living relatives for damages. That's absurd, and reparations are no different. And lastly, you cannot claim that black people today are poor because of slavery when so many black people are successful who, according to this theory, are destined for failure because of slavery. Today, 55% of black households rank economically as middle class or above. If over half of black Americans can get to the middle class or above, then others can as well. If there was any racial group that should have difficulty making it in a white privileged America, it would probably be Asians. Since slavery, we've had wars in Japan, Vietnam, Korea, and still have tensions with China and North Korea. A Democrat icon, FDR, even created internment camps for Japanese Americans 80 years after slavery was abolished. With so many wars and conflicts across so many Asian countries, you'd think Asians would have a more difficult path than anyone for success in America. And yet, they have higher incomes than white people. Many of these high-income Asians are first or second generation Americans, but how could they be so successful so quickly if black people are still hindered by slavery? These are questions Americans, especially young Americans, are taught not to ask because they would expose Democrat lies and propaganda about race in America. But let's continue. Right. It's a pattern that definitely needs to be addressed. And so the natural place would have been the Democratic Party. What? <laughs> the Democratic Party is more interested in serving the, the uh, economic interests of its actual constituents than it is serving the interests of its nominal constituents. And so why are you seeing something that looks uh, like a communist revolution beginning in the streets? for the natural reason, which is that people are feeling excluded from, uh, from their share, and they are being excluded, but... Democrats are interested in helping their constituents? No, the Democrat Party is not interested in helping their constituents. The Democratic Party has ruined black communities for decades. All the horrible things they blame Republicans for doing, Democrats did those things. The problem for black people is an allegiance to the Democratic Party. 
Secondly, again, he keeps saying there's a feeling the system is rigged and people are being excluded from their fair share. There is no such thing as your fair share. This is not a communist country where income or opportunity are distributed evenly and everyone has a cut. You are free to become as poor or as rich as you want. You have an equal share of freedom. But let's continue. But what we aspired to be was great. And uh, I, you know, I resent Trump's uh, make America great again because there are populations for whom it has simply never been great, right? So I, I think that last A in MAGA is just a finger in the eye for people and it was designed to be. Okay, so he says, MAGA is a finger in the eye of people and was meant to be because America hasn't been great for everyone. Compared to what? America is the freest, most prosperous society in human history. Was America great for slaves? Probably not, but there aren't slaves living today. So he's not talking to slaves when he says, make America great again, you idiot. Make America great again is a phrase that acknowledged that there were certain aspects to America that were better in the past than they are today. Once upon a time, Americans didn't live in fear that if they say the wrong thing, offend the wrong person, or simply have a different viewpoint, that they would be attacked by a fascist mob who smears them as racists and tries to ruin their reputation, get them fired from their jobs, get their family members fired from their jobs, and destroy their entire life. That was not a thing. Once upon a time, Christian bakers weren't harassed by the gay mafia for not baking a cake that conflicts with their Christian values, and they didn't have to spend years in court fighting for their religious freedom and business. Once upon a time, our children weren't targeted by pedophiles dressing up as women attempting to indoctrinate them with transgender nonsense. Once upon a time, people who were accused of rape were offered due process and not considered guilty just because they were accused without evidence. Once upon a time, People were allowed to defend their families and property from violent mobs seeking to harm them without being attacked by the government. Once upon a time, Americans weren't targeted by the IRS for opposing political viewpoints. Once upon a time, America was better than it is today for all people. If you want to say that America has not been great for some people, they at the very least had a lot more freedom than they do now because they did not have to worry about being canceled or targeted by mobs and have their families dragged through the mud for having a viewpoint the left opposes. So I'm going to skip ahead a little bit where they get to start talking about racism of the gaps, which is basically when there is a disparity of outcome in races, the left always attributes the disparity to some sort of discrimination, which of course is nonsense. But while lefties are happy to abide by this in other aspects, Weinstein rejects this racism of the gaps when it comes to science. But racism of the gaps says any place where that we see a success differential, the explanation is inherently racism. So if we see an mm. absence of black people in math, obviously the answer is racism. Do they apply that in areas where black people excel? No because this is a self-serving uh, modality. Like hip hop. Right, and so trying to parse what they're saying as if it has content, logical content, is a mistake. Mm -hmm. Trying to parse it as a tactical move makes a lot of sense. Okay. Processing it tactically is important. Yes, basically every argument of leftism is tactical, not truthful. I put this clip in here because it's a good reference for most of us to remember that most, if not all, of these claims are not about truth, but they are tactical moves. And what what do you think their motivation is? Power. Power. Well, again, so we what have to be careful if about they get they. through. They shut down STEM. Then what do they do? How do they, you know? Did they, are they thinking this far ahead? They're not playing this long game. Um. Okay. I would just I would tell people who aren't aware of me and what I think and believe that I am very progressive. I am very interested in making a fair system. That As am I. As am I, I. I. I know you. I know you are. So what I'm about to say sounds like one of those right wing crazy things. Uh oh. What they want? Well. Listen to how careful he is in prefacing his statement. This is what your party has done to the world, where people have to do this disclaimer thing before they share their opinion. We have to first state how progressive you are and then state something sensical because the left is so accustomed to classifying normal observations as right-wing crazy things to try and discredit a good observation. Imagine the following. Look, first of all, let's talk about reparations for a second. Okay. Okay. I am not a fan of the idea of reparations. I think it would be a terrible failure. It would be a disaster. 
But I do believe that something of very substantial magnitude is justified. I just don't think reparations is the answer. I completely agree. Okay. I think reform in terms of communities. I think uh, spending massive amounts of money to rebuild communities and give people hope. Yes. E economic opportunities. Massive investment yes. in communities that have been systematically frozen out. So this is a common suggestion made by people on the left or people who are apolitical uh, to fix black communities we need massive investment. What do you think the war in poverty was about? Massive investment in these communities without a regime change would just give more money to the corrupt Democrat politicians and interest groups that have been destroying their communities to begin with. Massive investment is about as intellectually lazy of a suggestion as you could possibly make. The shiny new buildings won't do anything for those communities when there's massive crime there. Businesses aren't going to move in that area in that office building when there's a bunch of crime and violence. But to highlight this garbage, let's look at the beautiful third world Democrat city of Baltimore, Maryland. In 2015, Bernie Sanders blasted West Baltimore like it to a third world country. The next year, Bernie lamented in a tweet, residents of Baltimore's poorest boroughs have lifespans shorter than people living under dictatorship in North Korea. That is a disgrace. What Bernie didn't mention is that Baltimore has been governed by Democrats for over 50 consecutive years. And like Detroit, Democrats have driven Baltimore straight into the ground. In the 1950s and early 60s, Baltimore was booming. The city had nearly a million residents. The median family income was 7% higher than the national average. In 1967, Democratic mayors started to take over, which have continued to this day. Baltimore's mayor from 1971 to 1987, William Donald Schaefer, set the stage for economic decline by greatly expanding the public public sector and regulations on businesses. From 1950 to 1985, Baltimore raised property taxes 21 times to the highest in the state of Maryland, causing businesses to relocate out of Baltimore. In 1987, Schaefer was succeeded by Baltimore's first elected black mayor, Kurt Schmoke, who was a close friend of Bill Clinton and had connections to a number of Clinton administration officials, as well as the head of HUD, current New York Governor Andrew Cuomo. Like his predecessor Schaefer, and Democrats in general, Schmoke was also extremely corrupt. One initiative of Schmoke was to establish an empowerment zone, whose goal was to transform distressed areas of the city into neighborhoods of choice by implementing a host of job training, work workforce development, home construction, and drug treatment programs funded by a $100 million federal grant, aka your tax dollars. The program had little effect on poverty. Probably the greatest indication of its impact is that the empowerment zone lost population at more than double the rate of the rest of the city of Baltimore. But with Democrat leadership comes corruption. The Schmoke administration was scarred by corruption. In the mid-90s, federal officials were alerted to the fact that the mayor's Housing Authority had squandered some $25 million that had been earmarked for housing repairs. Ultimately, the scandal resulted in federal convictions against 13 contractors. During the 1990s, which was an economic boom period, Baltimore managed to lose 58,000 jobs. The city's unemployment rate during the 1990s was twice that the rest of Maryland, and by the end of the 1990s, the murder rate in Baltimore was six times higher than the murder rate in New York. Baltimore's widespread political corruption, failing economy, high taxes, and escalating crime rates caused its city population to fall by more than 120,000 during the decade of the 1990s. Today, Baltimore has 47,000 abandoned houses and 16,000 vacant buildings. But don't worry, they still have an unfunded pension liability of $765 million. But don't tell Joe Rogan or Brett Weinstein any of this. The solution is massive investment in these communities. Because money can fix anything. Well, there has been investment made. In 2018, Trump gave Elijah Cummings District $16 billion in federal grants. Lynn Patton, a regional administrator for HUD, said, We have given more money in community development grants than the last administration to Baltimore. My question to you guys is this. What are you actually doing with the money so that it benefits residents in the community for once instead of deep pocket crooked politicians? But this story is not unique. This is what Democrats do in these heavily minority neighborhoods. To distract from their disastrous policies and corruption, they point to race or more funding. Massive investment is a solution for the lazy thinking and in some ways, the only option for those with an allegiance to the Democratic Party. A shiny new building does nothing when no business wants to set up shop there, when small businesses can't afford the property taxes there. Massive investment cannot and will not do anything especially when the corrupt criminal democratic enterprises are the ones handling that massive investment. But let's continue. But here's the thing about the Eric Gardner case. 
they should have never fucking arrested that guy in the first place. He was just selling loose cigarettes. Like, what kind of a world we're living in where you grab a guy by his neck because he's selling loose cigarettes? And when those guys did tackle him and take him down to the ground and held on to him when he said he can't breathe, he also appeared to be in poor health. And it was likely that the altercation, which probably wouldn't have killed you, killed him. And it was awful, terrible. But this was a hundred times worse. Well, can we come, you say, what kind of a world are we living in where somebody uh, selling loose cigarettes has this kind of interaction? And, yes. you know, we can say the same thing for George Floyd, right? We're talking about... Yeah, counterfeit $20 uh, bills, counterfeit nothing. To, yeah, right. The, what kind of world has these interactions with police over these issues? These interactions happened because the criminals decided to fight back against the police for arresting them for their crimes. Joe Rogan thinks the police just went up and pummeled these people. That's not what happened. They tried to arrest them and then they fought back and then they pummeled these people. An easy solution is not defunding police, but encouraging cooperation with law enforcement, not encouraging resistance, which ends up getting black people killed. But let's continue. Police brutality is a feature, not a bug. Yes, right? I agree with you. So what I mean by that is if you are going to freeze people out of their share of the well-being that is generated by society. What the hell are you talking about? Who is frozen out of prosperity? Who is freezing people out of their share or well-being that is generated by society? Well-being is not generated by society. It is generated by individuals who make individual choices in life. Society doesn't just pump out jobs or wealth or anything of that nature. Individuals do that. Intellectuals give people who have the handicap of poverty the further handicap of a sense of victimhood. Yes. Close quote. Explain that, Tom. They, intellectuals have a great tendency to see poverty as a great moral problem to which they have the solution. Now, the human race began in poverty. So there's no mysterious explanation as to why some people are poor. The question is why have some people gotten prosperous? And in particular, why have some gotten prosperous to a greater degree than others? But everybody started poor. So poverty is not a mystery to be solved by intellectuals. More than that, I think one, one of the things I wish I'd put more emphasis on in the book is that intellectuals have no interest in, in what creates wealth and what inhibits the creation of wealth. They are very concerned about the distribution of it, but they act as if wealth just exists somehow. So and it's only a question, it's like manna from heaven. It's only a question of how we split it up. And why should that be? Why shouldn't they find that question at least intellectually fascinating? Because it would destroy the whole vision that they have. Is if you are going to freeze people out of their share of the well-being that is generated by society you are going to have to keep them from revolting. And so what you do is you set up some sort of arbitrary administrator of authority that people run in contact with that they fear, right? You set up some force that disincentivizes misbehavior. And that force isn't just the police. It's obviously the, uh, the, uh, the prison system as well. This is some insane conspiracy theory that police and law enforcement are set up to stop black people from revolting because white people are busy preventing them from their fair share. You know we have black cops, right? It seems like people forget that. We have black police officers. Or they think that black cops don't realize they're part of this massive conspiracy theory to make sure black people don't revolt. This is white privilege on steroids. Oh, and by the way, the New York Times published an article on a study from researchers at Stanford, Harvard, and the Census Bureau. The Times headline read, Extensive data shows punishing reach of racism for black boys. According to the Times, young black men lag behind young white men, not because of behavioral differences, but because of widespread American racism. However, the study openly acknowledged that this racism doesn't seem to extend to black women. Somehow, no such income gap exists between black and white women raised in similar households. In fact, the study itself says that black women earn slightly more than white women conditional on parent income, and black women have higher college attendance rates than white men conditional on parental income. If black people are frozen out of opportunities, how come black women under equal circumstances are doing better than white women? How could that be if there was so much racism around? But let's continue. Uh, the prison system as well. Here's where I'd argue with you about that. Okay. That is that only applies if you only see that force exhibited towards poor people and disenfranchised communities, but you don't. 
what you see with police brutality is you see police brutality being utilized on wealthy people. Well, look, so I, it's not just a bug that's designed to keep people of disenfranchised communities from speaking out and demanding their fair share. It's a bug of human beings who have power over other human beings. It's when you know the Stanford prison experience, of course. Uh, experiments, which of course have been sort of discredited in some ways. That they actually probably wanted out of it, and so they expect. But the idea behind it makes sense to us. That if you give people power over people, they kind of tend to abuse it. When people have just unchecked authority over folks, they tend to they tend to use that. It's a, it's a it's a feature of human beings. Oh, believe me. I mean, like I said before, uh, I only told you the um, the simpler story of my run in with the cops. Right. I know that that. Putting a badge on somebody and giving them a weapon and giving them all of that power, um, it brings the worst out in many people. And it's very, very uh, – it's very dangerous. Yes. Okay, this is a great point by Joe. It's not a new point. It's the basic argument of conservatives. Power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. This is part of why conservatives don't like big government. And yet Joe Rogan said he would vote for Bernie Sanders. Surprisingly, Weinstein even agrees and suggests we should be wary of those we give power to. Ah, but abuses of power could never happen to other people in government, right? Only police officers are corrupt. It can't happen to mayors or members of Congress or senators or people in the White House. Yeah, it can, and this is why you don't want the government to be powerful. It's shocking that these lefties can talk about how dangerous power is and how easily corruptible people are, and yet they both want the government to have more power and control over our lives. But let's continue. But I still, uh, I still see something systemic here that isn't being discussed. I don't think we disagree on that. I think that's there as well. I think there's multiple factors. Well, multiple factors, yes. But let's put it this way. My claim is that opportunity is being hoarded, right? At the top of the economic ladder, opportunity is widespread. You can do very well. The farther you get down the economic ladder, the less opportunity there is and the greater the danger of your falling off the bottom. He says there's no ladder to pull themselves out of poverty, but there was a ladder which was set up specifically so people could pull themselves out of poverty, and it was called education. Our education system was designed to be the way out for everyone, which is why public school is available for all children. Thanks to Democrats, black people have terrible schools, many students drop out, particularly students with no fathers, and Democrats oppose all forms of reforming schools like school vouchers for charter schools because Democrats are beholden to teachers' unions. So Democrats cannot and will not ever fix the broken education system that they've destroyed because they need the money and support from teachers unions. To highlight this disaster, let us go back to Baltimore. The Baltimore City Public Schools spend an average of $15,483 for each K-12 student in their jurisdiction, which is almost 50% more than the national average. Baltimore students perform near the bottom nationally. In 2013, results indicated that only 14% of Baltimore's 4th graders and 16% of 8th graders were able to read proficiently. In math, the corresponding proficiency figures for 4th graders and 8th graders was 19% and 13%. But the Baltimore Teachers Union has successfully opposed any calls for a voucher program that would enable low-income parents to take their children out of the city's failing public schools and send them instead, for a fraction of the cost, to a private or charter school. There was not a single student that was proficient in math across 13 different schools. Did evil Republicans do all this? Right. In some communities, you start off off the bottom. Yes. Right. And you cannot access the ladder up. In such cases, it is not surprising that people resort to crime. The reason most people yes. do not resort to crime is that they have better options. And right. people are wired to pick better options. So... Suggesting poor people cannot lift themselves up and are prone to crime because of a lack of options is a perfect example of the bigotry of low expectations. Instead of encouraging them to grab the ladder and climb it, you assume that black people don't have the agency or the conviction to turn away from crime. It's just a natural outgrowth of their situation, which is insulting, bigoted, racist, and disgusting. The reality is, most people in these circumstances don't turn into criminals. Most poor people are not criminals. This fact must be ignored when you attribute criminals to be only the result of poverty. Well, how come we have other people who are poor who are not in jail? This is Democrat racism at its core. 
It's the bigotry of low expectations that some of these black people are poor and turn to crime because they don't have other options. So we can't hold them to the same standard as white people, and it's garbage. Thomas Sowell writes, The very terms of the discussion encourage them to attribute their less fortunate position to social barriers, if not political plots, and so to neglect the kind of efforts and skills which are capable of lifting them to higher economic and social levels. But let's continue. Now, let's... Um Let's go back to the question of how opportunity is distributed. Okay, so for some populations, you have very little opportunity and you have a tremendous hazard of falling off the bottom of the ladder and not having, there's not enough um, mechanism to allow you to get back to it. That creates uh, crime. Let's say that those who control or who uh, write the rules of the system do not want a revolt, even though this scenario would set them up for it, right? So. One thing that happens is you create a tendency to incarcerate, right? You have rules that free certain people out of opportunity, and then you have a system that is capable of incarcerating massive numbers of them. And we uh, incarcerate a much larger fraction of our population than any comparable nation. Again, Opportunity is not distributed by anyone. He even says there are rules that freeze people out of opportunity. What rules? Point to a law that freezes people out of opportunities. He can't, no leftist can, and they never can and never will because there aren't any. But I will say, when it's common for people on the left to discourage civility by saying that civility is nothing but white privilege, that's probably not going to help black people become more successful or stay out of trouble when civility is considered white privilege. Now, as far as the accusations that our prison system is basically set up to prevent a revolt, as Thomas Sowell writes, in this formulation, common among the intelligentsia, people are in jail because they cannot function in this society. It is not they do not choose to function, but to prey on others instead and to commit acts that are crimes in all sorts of countries. Usually, neither evidence nor logic is asked or given for such blanket indictments of society. It is simply part of the chief glory to take a stand against society. Unfortunately, what many call society is in fact civilization. Many of those pursuing a vision of cosmic justice simply take an adversarial position against tradition, morals, and institutions that make the survival of this civilization possible, which what currently exists as the fruits of centuries of efforts and sacrifices is inferior to what they can produce in their imagination immediately at zero cost in the comfort and security provided by the society that they disdain. So if you're going to accuse America of incarcerating black people to uphold this conspiracy theory, you have to ignore or deliberately not ask the question, are these crimes that people are being incarcerated for, are they also crimes in other countries, particularly in other countries that do not have a white majority? Jamaica is largely black. Are things like murder, rape, assault, drug trafficking, human trafficking, fraud, theft, burglary, are these also crimes in Jamaica? Yeah, they are. But when you ask those types of questions, the whole theory falls apart. So of course, leftists are told never to ask such a question. But also, a large prison population is not necessarily a bad thing. Prison population, they say this like it's a bad thing. A, 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 sometimes conservatives fall into this trap too. A large prison population means that we are locking up our criminals. That's a good thing. When we had a lower prison population in the early 90s and late 80s, we had a lot more criminals on the street committing a lot more violent crimes. Now we have many more people in prison and a much lower crime rate. Good thing. Lock them up. Lock more of them up. I want, I want more prison, a, a greater prison population, so we have lower crime. But let's continue. If you really wanted to help America, if you're really patriotic, what's the best way to help America? Well, you'd want less losers. How do you get less losers? You find the spots where the people have an unfair sh shot. And you, you fix that. You fix those spots, whether it's the south side of Chicago, whether it's Baltimore. You find these disenfranchised areas and you fix them. That's the only way. You give people much more opportunity. You give people you, – you, you, you set it up so people have, if not the same advantage, a far superior advantage that, than they have now in terms of their ability to make it – through the navigate the the terrifying waters of being a young adult and, and getting through the system without going to jail and without making terrible mistakes and then having some sort of an economic opportunity that it gives you hope that you actually strive for something and you get rewarded for your effort and you see other people get rewarded for that effort as well and that becomes the model 
that you're using. You, you use this model of, you know, the model that we see in a, in a lot of uh, upper middle class communities. You see, there's a path. Mike made it through. Look at Mike. Now he has a Corvette. You know, Tom made it through. Look at that nice house. And you see that and you just emulate that. Whereas in these communities that have been established, they, they, they've, they've had this problem for decade after decade and nothing's been done about it. And so they hear all this this talk from politicians about black unemployment and this and that. But meanwhile, the fucking neighborhood is exactly the same. No one's done anything to fix it. No one's done anything to, 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 I mean, and I think it's a tremendous problem in terms of like what effort needs to be done to fix it. And I'm a moron. I'm not the guy to fix it. I don't, I don't understand how it could be done. I don't know, but I don't, I, but I do understand that there's not work being put into doing it other than through the people in the community and community activists and, and some, some people that have, you know, that are philanthropists that have tried to figure out a way to, to do their best to put a dent in it. It's never been addressed on a national level. It's not addressed like no, no one's, no president has ever made an address, even Obama, where they've sat down and said, here's the areas of this country where it's really hard to make it. And this is what we're going to do to fix that. And this administration today, here and now, declares unconditional war on poverty in America. More must be done to reduce poverty and dependency. And believe me, nothing is more important. Than First of all, in the short run, the most important thing we can do is to lift the bottom. We know that deep, persistent poverty is unworthy of our nation's promise. Joe Rogan asks, how do you get less losers? Well, you teach them to help themselves. You teach them to fish, not give them a fish. They touch on the problem of black communities having absent fathers in this conversation. So they do have a brief discussion about that, but that is the big central problem of these communities and would solve a lot of problems. But two, the other ticket out of this would be to get these black kids out of these terrible schools and get them into private and charter schools where they clearly and obviously perform better when they're in charter schools. And the third thing to do, which is the only way number one and number two can happen, is to elect Republicans. But then it gets worse because he says nobody is addressing the problem or nobody has ever tried doing anything about it. So I have another video where I show a 1928 interview when a man has asked the exact same question people are asking today, which is, do poor people have the same opportunities as rich people? There's this historical amnesia, especially on the left, where people think that these are new discoveries and they think that people haven't been trying to fix these issues in these communities in the past and they just sort of ignored them. Uh, they cannot be fixed so long as Democrats continue to poison these people's minds and communities with false reasons designed to conceal the failure of Democrat policies. Plenty has been done. Plenty of investments have been made, but they haven't had radical change because Democrats have controlled these communities throughout the entire war on poverty and have controlled all these massive investments. And so nothing gets better because Democrats have an interest in making sure that black people can continue to be perpetual victims so that they can play the race card and continue to gain their votes and gain power and more taxpayer money. This is no more obvious than the left's position against school choice, which would benefit black people. But let's continue. What's the root? Um, the root is a system that is so politically corrupt that it is not even interested in doing what it needs to do. It is interested in doing the bare minimum that it can do that prevents revolt. And now it's screwed up. Now it's got revolt on its hands. But if you actually wanted to solve this problem, you have to solve it at the causal level, right? You can't have a, a system in which people are choosing between candidates from two corrupt parties, both of which are uh, hell-bent on stealing well-being from them and transferring it to their actual constituents. So here, Brett Weinstein does something that Joe Rogan does relatively frequently. When Democrats do something awful and the Democrat Party is riddled with corruption at every level of government, they say, oh, this happens at both parties. Both parties are at fault and both parties are responsible. Uh, no, these communities were much better when conservatives ran them. They will never get better so long as Democrats continue to advance policies that hurt them in the long run and fill their minds with angst about racism. It's not both parties, it's the Democrat Party. Now next is this professor, Brett Weinstein, proposes probably the dumbest solution to American politics that I've heard in a while. But it's shocking that anyone responsible for educating students would be this stupid and naive. Let's hear it. So here's the, the plan. Um, this plan needs a better name, but the working title is the Dark Horse Duo Plan. Um, and the plan looks like this. We draft 
two individuals. We find two people. One of them is center left and one of them is center right. And these people have to have certain characteristics, a minimum set. They have to be patriotic, they have to be courageous, and they have to be highly capable, right? But that's it. Okay. Center left and a center right. And we pair them together. And we draft them uh, with the following plan, that they will govern as a team. That is to say, every important decision will be uh, discussed and they will decide what to do as a team and only in cases where they cannot reach agreement or whether something has to be whenever something has to be decided on a very short time scale like a military decision um, does the person who inhabits the role of the president uh, govern alone okay we draft these folks and then four years down the road they switch and the one who had run for president now runs for the vice presidential spot, and the one who uh, was vice president now runs for president. And they continue this way until one of two things happens. Either we vote someone else in, or one of them has inhabited the office of president twice and is no longer eligible, and then that person has to be replaced. So we have a patriotic team governing together from center left and center right. But when you say drafted, that's the problem. Like someone has to be motivated to ruin their fucking lives to try to run this country because well, that's what happens to everybody that does it. I agree, but then that's an obstacle. You're spelling out right. an obstacle that I would argue is solvable, that we know these people. Who? Okay, so okay. let's just say that's the plan so far, and yes. we can talk about what problems it solves. Okay, I mean, his theory is like, oh, let's get sort of a moderate right person and a moderate left person, and they can just work together, and they just have to be patriotic and courageous. Like, patriotism to the left does not mean the same thing as patriotism to the right. The left have this Orwellian thing where they use common and well-known words, but completely substitute the meanings. The left thinks violence is free speech, and free speech is violence. The left thinks men can menstruate and have uteruses. There's no common ground with people that you can reach when they don't even speak the same language. There's no common ground for people who openly destroy our history and rewrite our history to align with modern social justice theories, knowing that it's false. You can't have a left winger and right winger governed together. There's nothing, there, there's no common ground to find here. And then just wait for his suggestion of who these people might be. But my proposal would be uh, Admiral William McRaven on the right, you know who that is? No, I don't. Okay, he is a Navy SEAL, former Navy SEAL. Um, he was, until 2018, the Chancellor of the University of Texas. He is a um, very cogent uh, center-right Republican. Um, he was the lead on the bin Laden raid, and he is, uh, I think, universally respected by people who know him. I've never heard anybody say negative things about him. Um, on the center left... Let me see this gentleman. I'm going to look at his face. Yeah. You're, you're going to oh. know. There he oh, is. Oh, yeah. I have seen that guy before. Yeah. I like it. Looks like a president to me. Yeah, he looks like a president to me too. William McRaven as the conservative candidate? Are you, sh are you kidding me? McRaven wrote a column for the New York Times titled, Our Republic is Under Attack from the President. McRaven wrote about how Trump's attacks on the media is the greatest threat to democracy of his lifetime. McRaven has accused Trump's pushback against the media as an effort to suppress freedom of speech and punish critics. That's right. It's Republicans and Trump who are suppressing freedom of speech to punish critics, not Democrats and their censorship and banning and cancel culture and boycotts for any and everything that's said that they dislike. No, 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 no. It's Trump that's suppressing free speech to punish critics. William McRaven warned that Trump's policies were a stain on the United States and its values. William McRaven also wrote a column for the Washington Post where he criticized Trump and the White House's decision to revoke the security clearance of former CIA director John Brennan. John Brennan, the deep state, perjury committing, communist supporting John Brennan. William McRaven was even rumored to be considered as Hillary's vice president for a while. That's the Republican candidate that Brett Weinstein thinks should represent the right. Yeah, that's a guy who definitely represents the right side of the aisle. I'm sure Brett Weinstein would love another deep state leftist representing Republicans. Oh, and guess who McRaven would govern with? Andrew Yang. 
You know, that wannabe socialist whose grandiose plan is to centralize welfare just to make it all the more easier to turn up the ratchet with giveaways in exchange for votes to steal elections? Basically, this professor's plan to save America is to give liberals and the left complete unilateral control over the country. That's what's going to fix everything. Got it. But let's continue. The same idea as Hillary Clinton in a different morphology. Who cares? This is not an answer to any known question. Right. This is stay the course at a moment when we could not afford to stay the course less. Right. So, uh, uh, look, how dare the Democratic Party do this to us again at this moment? When they, if I thought that, I feel like they felt that if they got Joe Biden in there, if none of this stuff had happened, you would just be dealing with one solution to the problem that is Donald Trump. We did, we should have known that this was building. You can never afford to have somebody who isn't a courageous, capable patriot in that office. How dare they play games with this thing? It's yeah. not theirs to screw up. Right. And this also has highlighted the problem of Donald Trump's ego. Uh, Joe Biden is a stand-in for Antifa. The reason that Joe Biden is the candidate is because what Democrats actually believe is so repulsive to normal, decent human beings that the Elizabeth Warrens and Kamala Harris's who check all the diversity boxes, once they reveal the things that they want, people can see how ugly these people are inside. So the solution is a guy who can barely make a coherent sentence because he can just stand there and then Antifa and Black Lives Matter can pull the puppet strings and he's more than willing to do whatever they want him to do. Joe Biden is the candidate because he's been around for so long people are familiar with him and he makes people think that he won't govern like a radical leftist, but he will. It's like they've white labeled the presidency. He's a puppet for the radicals that know if they ran themselves, they'd never win the election. So they've sort of white labeled Joe Biden as a general Democrat, but the strings that he's being pulled by are operated by the radicals. Oh, and lastly, the rest of the conversation, they basically talk about healthcare and science and how corrupt the scientific institutions are in partnership with the government. So if you're interested in that, you should check out the last hour, which I won't cover. I don't know how to end this video, but this Joe Rogan episode was awful. Garbage, garbage, garbage.